Okay, so first we want to talk about why cities and why zero. We know that by 2060, world population is expected to increase by about 2.67 billion people. It's projected that by 2060, world urban population is expected to increase by 2.75 billion people, absorbing the entire population growth estimate. Or we can say that every week, roughly 1.5 million people are being added to our cities worldwide. This is a staggering number. Today, we know that global building floor area is about 220, 30 billion square meters. That's all the buildings in the world today. By 2060, global building floor area is expected to increase by 230 billion square meters or double the current world building stock. That means between now and 2060, in four decades, we're gonna rebuild or build or add on another entire planet in terms of building area. Here you can see building floor area go up, but energy consumption per square foot of floor area in buildings going down slightly. So buildings are becoming more efficient. However, it's not enough to offset the energy consumption that buildings are demanding between 1990 and 2016, and that number is expected to also go up. So let's dive down a little bit into the developed world, so U.S. building operations. We see that in the U.S., building energy consumption, total building sector, was going up till about 2005, and then it kind of leveled out, but it's not going down. So building energy cons consumption in the U.S is stable, but not going down. We see the same thing in Canada, building energy consumption in the commercial sector going up and then leveling off. But again, in the developed world, energy consumption is not going down in the building sector. We actually see the same thing in the EU, very flat. So in all the developed world, energy consumption in the building sector is flat, but not going down. If we dive down into the state level, our most progressive states that have really good incentives and things like that, we can see, again, New York State, energy consumption in the residential and commercial building sector flat. We can see the same thing in Pennsylvania. We can see the same thing here in Illinois. Again, flat. California, flat. Energy consumption in the building sector, despite all the programs that we have, are not going down. Now, if we look at the developing world, you can see building energy consumption going up dramatically. This is China in every sector, building sector in China. Energy consumption is going up. And in India, for example, building energy consumption of their total building sector is going up exponentially. So the doubling rate is very, very short in terms of building energy consumption. Now, we had an extraordinary event in December 2015 where the Eiffel Tower lit up 1.5 degrees Celsius, meaning that we agreed to keep global average temperature well below 2 degrees Celsius, preferably at 1.5. That means we have to phase out fossil fuel CO2 emissions in the entire built environment by about 2050 in order to meet that target. We know where all the emissions are coming from. 75% of all greenhouse gas emissions are coming from cities, from urban areas. And we know in cities where all the emissions are coming from. If we look at city by city and we look at the emissions coming from buildings, it's about two-thirds to three-quarters of all emissions in cities come from buildings. In Chicago here, it's 71%. So how do we do this? How do we phase out all emissions in the built environment, in the building sector, by the year 2050? Well, it takes three things. One is we need zero net carbon building energy codes, and they need to be adopted very, very quickly by 2020, and this is globally. Second, we need zero net carbon policies for existing buildings 
to begin to get them all to zero net carbon between now and 2050. And we need the codes and the policies to incentivize and create a stable market for renewable energy because buildings are going to use energy. So let's take the world, let's take a look at number one, building codes. Let's divide the world into global north and global south, roughly at 38 degrees north latitude running through the Mediterranean. If we look at building codes, we can see that there are mandatory building codes in the global north. Now, now all building energy codes are good, but at least there are codes in the global north. We can look in the global south, and we see no building codes, zero, or voluntary codes, which are essentially worthless. So now let's put on top of that where all the global building floor area exists in the world today. We can see that most of it is in the global north and China. North America, 38 billion square meters. Western Europe, and then China, obviously, has more building square footage than everywhere else in the world. So that's where most of the buildings exist. So we need to begin to renovate the buildings that exist down. We need to get, there, get them even more efficient. And we need to do more buildings. We need to go from roughly 1% to 1.5% of total building stock to 2 to 3%. And then we need to upgrade the codes in those areas to a zero net carbon building code so we don't keep adding all this energy consumption to the building sector. Now let's look at growth from now until 2030. It all moves south. China still builds, but then look at India, Africa, Southeast Asia, Latin America, that's where all the growth in the building sector is going to happen. So in the global south, in the, develop, in the developing countries, we need a zero net carbon building code today to get adopted by the year 2020 so that all this building construction comes in at zero net carbon. And if we look at building growth from 2030 to 20, 2050, you can see that China then stops growing because it's then all built out, and then the growth moves dramatically into India, Africa, and Latin America, Southeast Asia. That's where there's going to be tremendous growth. So three weeks ago, we issued the Zero Code. It's actually a zero net carbon national and international building code standard. So the building, so the Zero Code is ready to be adopted, just issued. We're doing a new one for the state of California, for the governor's office and the California Energy Commission. That'll be ready in a month or so. Now, the zero code is really nothing new. It's not reinventing something new. It's taking an existing code standard, our latest code standard, which are very efficient, and then taking that code standard and implementing it. So you have two pathways to meet the code. One, you can check off the boxes. I'm going to do this much insulation and this much lighting, things like that. Or if you want to get inventive, you can use a performance path. We have lots of models to do that. If you use a very efficient code that we already have today, that'll give you an estimated energy consumption of your building before it gets built. And then you could add on the on-site or in urban areas, you're going to have to purchase renewable energy and bring that in. What the zero code does is creates a stable and predictable, predict, predictable market for renewable energy. We know how much building is going to be going on. We know what building types. We know how much energy they're going to need. And we know how much renewable. So this, the codes actually get you an incredibly stable and robust market. Let's take a look at Chicago, a high-rise office building, 20 stories. If we put it on a scale, a typical high-rise, we put that on a scale at 100, uses about 122,000 BTUs a square foot a year. If we use our latest code standard, then that building will use only about 29,000, a, a reduction of over 70%. That's just meeting the latest code standards we have in the US. So Chicago has to adopt the latest code standards. So that is the efficiency reduction from a typical office building in Chicago to a new office building built to our latest code standards. And then we then know how much 
on-site and off-site renewables we, we need, and that creates the market. We could take that same building type and put it in Shanghai, and we see the same reductions. In kilowatt hours a square meter, Shanghai is about 313. You get about a 70% reduction of efficiency, and then you, again, need the on-site and off-site renewables. So that's one, the code. Second is policies for existing buildings. In many U.S. cities, there are very few big buildings and lots and lots of small buildings. And if you add up the big buildings and the small buildings, they each use about 50%, half of all the energy consumption that buildings use in that city. So for example, let's take a look at Seattle. You can see all the big buildings clustered around the downtown area and then miles and miles of small buildings. In Seattle, 2.8% of Seattle's buildings, over 20,000 square feet, produce 45% of all the greenhouse gas emissions. So a very small number of buildings are responsible for a huge amount of emissions. If we look at Long Beach, California, all the high-rise buildings are along the coast and then miles and miles of small buildings. So less than 1% of the big buildings, over 10,000 square feet, not that big, are responsible for 40% of all emissions. New York City, the same thing. The buildings are concentrated in lower Manhattan, Midtown, and Brooklyn. And you can see that 2.7% of New York City's buildings produce about 48% of all emissions. You can see the same thing in city after city. This is Los Angeles. You can see the high-rise buildings and miles and miles of low-rise. San Francisco, Boston, Minneapolis, Phoenix, the same situation, Philadelphia, and even here in Chicago. You have few big buildings, lots of small buildings. Each group uses about half the energy. So now you can develop a policy. You can develop a policy based on big buildings and small buildings. We know that building energy efficiency improvements cost about 75% less if you're undertaking a capital improvement cycle, actually doing a renovation. If you require the efficiency upgrades at that time, it's a minimal cost. We also know that very few buildings are bought and sold every year, but a huge number, thousands and thousands of small buildings are bought and sold every year. So developing a big buildings policy and a small buildings policy. For big buildings, what we say is that cities should require an energy upgrade to meet a 50% average reduction in building energy consumption over the next 12 years. Roughly give building owners 12 years to meet this target so they can hit a capital improvement cycle. In which case, the cost of getting a 50% reduction is really minimal. And then we say, create another target for 2050, which is zero net carbon. So now they have another 20 years to do that. Most buildings will undergo a number of renovation cycles between that time period. And then give incentives for buildings that want to meet the zero net carbon in their first cycle. Give them incentives to do that. So you start getting buildings in cities, the big buildings, the zero net carbon. Now, you don't have that many owners to deal with because there are few big buildings. So you shouldn't have much pushback because you're giving them plenty of time. On small buildings where you have thousands and thousands of buildings, you require a bit building energy upgrade. If you're actually doing an upgrade for seismic or flooding, if you go in and want a zoning or use change, the city's actually giving you something, make your property more valuable. They should require a, a renovation or at point of sale, when the building changes hands, you require the new owner to upgrade the building to zero net carbon standards, and you provide incentives for any owner who wants to get their building up to zero net carbon standards, you provide incentives for them. In some areas, like in China, parts of Europe, you don't have that big buildings, small buildings scenario. You, you don't have many, many buildings changing hands, things like that. So in that case, you just have an all buildings policy. So if we do two, three things, we do a zero net carbon code that basically incentivizes renewables. We do policies for big buildings, small buildings, or all buildings. 
that also incentivizes renewables, that gets all buildings to zero net carbon. We then incentivize renewables and meet the 1.5 degree Celsius target set up by the international community. I'll leave you with that. Thank you.